Welcome in. It's a beautiful Monday afternoon. Moving into the early evening, and we have a Javon Kinlaw update thanks to social media. Why don't we just have a quick look at this from Javon Kinlaw's mouth? Uh, how you feel now, bro? I mean, I feel good, man. Another work day. Coach Aaron, you know, shit. Just working on my change ups, my curve balls. You know, you just working. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Dylan <line> Viz, baby. <laughs> yes, sir. You saw that picture of Javon Kinlaw, that video of Javon Kinlaw, down to 305 pounds, according to that video. And that's something that I have confirmed. Javon Kinlaw has indeed cut about 15 pounds from his listed weight of 319 last year to 305 now. So he is lean and mean right now. 6'5, 305 pounds. What does that lower weight mean? Well, He's trying to develop as much flexibility as possible. The last time we saw Javon Kinlaw, the knee wasn't doing too well. There's a lot of fluid buildup in the knee. He's trying to manage that at the end of the 2022 season and the playoffs against Philadelphia. And he wasn't, because of that, he wasn't getting good leverage, right? He wasn't able to get down against run blocks. He was getting pushed around in mainly the first half of that game against Philadelphia. The tape in the second half looked a little, looked a little bit better. So for a guy as big as Kinlaw, Cutting that weight, especially with the knee issues, is a way to better, you know, better take care of that knee. That knee can handle a little bit more of a load if he's lighter. So the workload is going to continue uh, to be efficient for Javon Kinlaw, like this past season, where the more that we saw him on the field, the less effective he was because he still wasn't fully recovered. The knee, the fluid was building up. Well, now Javon Kinlaw is fully healthy. That's something that John Lynch is really excited about. That's something that Javon Kinlaw himself is really excited about. It's his first offseason in a long time that he's entered fully healthy, and he's been able to focus on cutting the weight to be lighter, to be more flexible, with the hope being that he's going to end up being a more explosive pass rusher and also a better defender against the run at that lighter weight because of the leverage concerns, the weight concerns on his knee. As we've already seen, this was last week. This is Fred Warner and Javon Kinlaw partaking in some Pilates in the South Bay area. And for a man as big as Javon Kinlaw, and we were talking 305 pounds, for him to be able to do some of these balancing workouts, I mean, even for Fred Warner, it's super impressive. But people who have done some of these workouts, they look at the size of these athletes and they're impressed because the average person who's much lighter than this can't do this kind of stuff. Well, since Fred Warner and Javon Kinlaw, who are much larger than the average person are doing it, that is super, super impressive. But Kinlaw doing this work has moved down from 319 to 305. We'll play the video one more time of Javon Kinlaw on the field today, the D-line vid. Uh, that's who we're sourcing it to. They had the shout out there at the end because it is a promising update for Javon Kinlaw moving into this next season. Here's the big thing for Javon Kinlaw. Javon Hargrave, don't confuse Javon Kinlaw's name for Javon Hargrave's name. You pronounce them differently. It is Javon and Javon. Javon Hargrave is the star that the 49ers sign. Javon Kinlaw is the existing player who was drafted in the first round back in 2020. Javon Hargrave is aboard to obviously be a starter. He's an all-pro caliber player. Big addition for the 49ers. He's going to complement Nick Bosa really well, and they're going to have, theoretically, a monstrous defensive line. Javon Kinlaw now gets bumped down from a starter position down to a rotational depth piece. And with this move, I think that this could be really good for Javon Kinlaw. I know John Lynch thinks this. I know Kyle Shanahan thinks this. I mean, the guy has dealt with a really, really bad hand of injury luck. He tore his ACL in 2020. It seems that it was misdiagnosed because he started playing without it being repaired in 2021. Then they found out about halfway through that it was torn. That led to a massive setback in the ACL reconstruction surgery. And this last year when Kinlaw was coming off that ACL reconstruction surgery, the, the knee, the fluid started building back up just because it's not easy to go under that kind of surgery and play football at 320 pounds. Anybody criticizing Javon Kinlaw should probably try doing those two things. Bulk up to 320, try playing an NFL game, coming off an ACL tear, probably won't be easy leaving that surgery, right? So 
you know, you, you look at the management the 49ers had to go, go through with Kinlaw's knee last year. They decided to bring him back late in the season. I think they sh- probably made a mistake, should have brought him back a little bit later because he only had a finite amount of reps in him last year before that knee went out again. Now he's actually fully healthy. He's had some time off. He's had a chance to, you know, just let that knee stop barking, settle down. And he can go into this offseason working on his technique. Right now, he's working on explosive pass rush technique. He can go and work on lower leverage against the run and against some pass blocking. He can work on all that technique from a fully healthy platform instead of rehabbing, which was the case last season. And I think that's, you know, that's big. And so is the fact that Javon Hargrave is going to be taking most of the snaps. And Javon Kinlaw is not going to be counted on to take 40 snaps a game, even 30 snaps a game. Probably looking at 15 to 20 a game, mainly in situational package opportunities, right? Where Javon Kinlaw is going to be rushing the passer. And we know that he's explosive for his size. We know that he's got tremendous talent. And maybe he can concentrate that talent, that explosiveness into that rotational Roll and even if he can't, it's not the end of the world because the 49ers aren't relying on him anymore. That's the magic of picking up Javon Hargrave. So it's the tale of Javon and Javon on the inside for the 49ers. And you know, a lot of people scream, cut Javon Kinlaw, trade him, do whatever. Guys, it's going to be hard to trade somebody who hasn't been able to stay healthy. He's played a total of 10 games in the regular season over the past two seasons. And as a first round pick, Kinlaw's entire contract is fully guaranteed. This is the last season of that contract. I doubt, highly doubt, the 49ers are going to pick up the fifth-year option. They will for Brandon Ayuk, who was a fifth-round pick in 2020, but probably not for Javon Kinlaw. And that means that $2.7 million is remaining in base salary for this next season. And since it's fully guaranteed, the 49ers owe Javon Kinlaw this regardless. So if they cut him, they still owe him the money. There is no benefit to cutting Javon Kinlaw. He's better than their 11th or 12th best defensive lineman, depending on how many they take on the 53. Maybe they only take 10. But, you know, the thing is, you see what you have here because it's a sunk cost already. You owe him at $2.9 million regardless. If you cut Javon Kinlaw, then it's $4.9 million of dead money because you also own, oh, the signing bonus proration against the cap. All right, quick recap here. Javon Kinlaw now, is I back mean- at it. I feel good, man. Another work day. Coach Aaron, you know, shit. Just working on my change ups, my curve balls. You know, you just working. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> D-line Viz, baby. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> All right, let's move it to a 49ers Q&A with that update on Javon Kinlaw. I'll take a couple questions. Maybe do a 10-minute show right now. We've got more coming on Debo Samuel's contract and some maneuvering that the 49ers are doing a little bit later. All right, what's going on, everybody? Let's talk. Randy Daytona says the Kinlaw looks way more ripped, and he was ripped to begin with. I mean, he's always had an impressive physical stature, but I think given the knee issues, 320 was a little bit too heavy to play on. You got to be a little bit lighter than what you thought was your optimal weight with, with healthy knees. And at this point, 305, I think, is going to be good for Javon Kinlaw, so he's not getting pushed around as much because he's getting too high. That weight can come down now a little bit lower. Just a couple inches is going to make a big deal in the game of leverage against strong interior offensive linemen. Mike points out that we got 97 subs until 37,000, so go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Mike looks at Joan Kinlaw and sees DeForest Buckner gone. They kept Armstead and traded DeForest Buckner for that pick. Well, it was way more complicated than that. They also re-signed Jimmy Ward, who they needed over the past couple of years with that pick. They had leftover money beyond that, right? DeForest Buckner was more expensive than Eric Armstead, and they're hoping that they were going to be able to get a plug-and-play replacement in Javon Kinlaw. The knee has made that something that you know hasn't happened so far, but now they have Javon Hargrave. And I'll tell you what, Javon Hargrave is a better pass rusher than DeForest Buckner. So all things considered, the 49ers are now in a better overall position than they were before. And maybe Kinlaw is going to start to, str- uh, to thrive now that he's coming off the bench on a rotational basis. Uh, I don't know if there is an update to be had on Kalia Davis. The 49ers expect him to play next year. Explosive player reminds them of DJ Jones uh, was practicing at the end of the year. They didn't activate him just because they didn't want to throw him into the fire in the playoffs for his first career action. But this is a stack linebacker in college converted to a defensive tackle. You don't see that transition happen ever really. Do the 49ers think can 
really give them some oomph on the inside. And that's going to be depth, right? The two starting defensive tackles, and I have a big article on the D-line coming out tomorrow morning on the Athletic. I think the dollar a month deal is still going to be out then, so I'll make sure to let you know about it. But the two starting defensive tackles for the 49ers next year are going to be Javon Hargrave and Eric Armstead. The depth that you build behind them, are you going to have Kevin Givens? They re-signed him. You're going to have Javon Kinlaw. He's obviously under contract for another year. And then Clea Davis can filter in there. It's going to be a nice rotation for the 49ers of interior defensive linemen. That was the weakness of this defense last year, and it's definitely lining up to be a strength in 2023. And, hey, isn't that the point of the offseason? Turn your weaknesses from the year prior into strengths the year ahead. No word yet on Jason Verrett. That's something I should have asked about at the owners' meetings last week. But can ask about it this coming maybe on April 11th or April 12th. I think that's when the 49ers local pro day is. So I'll be at the 49ers facility then, then be back again at the end of April for the NFL draft. Randy Daytona asks, will we see Armstead at edge more if Ken Lock and stay upright this season? I don't think so because I think that the 49ers really are counting on Drake Jackson to make a jump, Cleveland Farrell to make a jump, although he wasn't previously with them. Guys like Austin Bryant are there. Maybe they even add another veteran edge rusher or a, a draftee. I think that they really like Eric Armstead on the inside. Do I anticipate, oh, sorry, need number one at the draft. I don't think the 49ers have a top need at the draft. I think the 49ers have all the positions covered and they could get better at some, right? They can get better at right tackle. They can get better at kicker. They can add competition at certain spots. They can add future depth at spots like safety, but they've taken care of their pressing needs. They can go best player available in the draft. And that's probably something that you should do when you have draft capital that's not particularly valuable in the league's eyes for the 49ers. Their first pick isn't until number 99. In fact, in fact uh, Mike shared a, a graphic with me today that showed that the 49ers draft capital based on point values aside into picks was the least in the NFL, despite the fact that they have 11 picks. They just don't start picking until really late. This was the question I was trying to get to. Do you anticipate another pitch count for Kinlaw this year? Maybe, but the pitch count's going to be natural now. It's not going to be one where, where they have to manually give him 20 pitches or, or 20, 20 snaps. It's going to be one where he's going to be a rotational piece, so he's not going to be in there for 30 to 40 snaps like a starter would be at that defensive tackle position. That's why they're paying Javon Hargrave. They hope that Eric Armstead is going to be more healthy than he was last year when he only played nine games, and the 49ers hope that that solves their problems. All right, Mike just shared this with me. I'm going to pop it open onto the screen. It's it, it, it's it's interesting here. It's a look at the 49ers draft capital and how many you know how much value each pick has, given the fact that the picks obviously aren't coming in a standard position. They're coming toward the end of the third round for the 49ers. I just have to get this sucker open for you guys. Sometimes it's hard to find things, but sometimes I do a little bit. Oh, I got it. Here it is. We use WhatsApp to communicate. All right. Sharing the screen. There it is. Somebody named Graham Barfield shared this on Twitter today. This is NFL draft capital ranked by val total value owned by each team. And you can see the 49ers way down here last 388 points, a lot less than even number 31, the Browns that despite the fact the 49ers have 11 picks, the only team with more picks, the Raiders with 12, the Rams also have 11, not all that valuable. They're down here. And the Texans have 11, but the Texans have 11, and they also have valuable picks in the first round for D'Amico, Ryans, and company. 5,008 points. 49ers only 388 points. Now, the 49ers have eight day three picks. That's more than anybody else. The Raiders also have eight, but the 49ers uh, and also the Rams. So the Rams, Raiders, and 49ers have eight day three picks. 49ers only three rounds, one to three picks, and all three of those come in the third round. Now, the good news is when you look at that is that the 49ers have been really good picking in the late rounds. That's really made their franchise over the course of the Shanahan Lynch era. So that's going to be big time money-making opportunities for the 49ers front office again in this upcoming NFL draft. 
I mean, yeah, theoretically, if D'Amico Ryan's wanted Lance, he could trade with him for draft picks. I don't know if he wants Lance, and I don't know how much the 49ers would require to give up Lance. Probably a lot. Like, I went through all this yesterday. Lance is very valuable to the 49ers because they can't afford to be subtracting quarterbacks right now. They need to be adding quarterbacks right now, if anything. And they, you know, Kyle Shanahan literally said the 49ers feel the same way about Lance as when they drafted him. He's unfortunately just gotten hurt, so he hasn't been able to progress the way that they've wanted him to. So if they felt that he was worth, you know, those three first round draft picks in 2021, including number three overall, well, they're probably not going to give him up for peanuts here in 2023, especially if the cap hit as far as dead money goes would punish the 49ers. It'd be more expensive to trade Trey Lance than to keep him at this point. And Anthony Louie, uh, along those lines, they're not trading Lance unless someone offers a first. And I tend to agree with that. But, um, you know, the 49ers really are looking to insulate the quarterback room and still find out what they might have in Trey Lance. Jedi wants a steal at cornerback. And, you know, I think a steal at corner, a steal at safety. Everybody's going to have to be a steal in a way if you're not picking until number 99. Even if you trade up a little bit, you're still looking for value uh, you know, you're still looking for a player that plays like a first rounder, even though he's drafted later. The 49ers have been good in their ability to do that, right? George Kittle, Tano, Hufanga, those types of players. DJ Jones back in the sixth round, 2017. Uh, and this year they are calling on their scouting department to come through like never before because they don't pick until late in the third round. I, you know, I don't know. I don't think anybody probably would offer a number one for an unproven product. I mean, you're, you're offering number one for unproven products in the draft, but now Trey Lance has the injury stigma following him around. They saw that the 49ers were a little bit reluctant to throw with him early in the season. And then he ran, he got hurt. You know, I don't blame Kyle Shanahan for the injury. It's a dual threat quarterback. He has to run. What I do though note is that the 49ers weren't fully comfortable and they broadcast this about Trey Lance's throwing mechanics, which means he's still a massive work in progress, which, you know, by extension, although teams knew this in the draft, now they have to deal with the fact that his ankle also got shattered this past season, and they're going to be making an even bigger bet, which is why the price and the value of Trey Lance has gone down since the draft. But you always have to look at it in terms of value to whatever team has him or is trying to acquire him. And the 49ers have him. He's very valuable to them because they ran out of quarterbacks last year. So that's that. I think the 49ers want to keep on bolstering that quarterback room. They don't want subtraction from that room. No Robbie Gold update right now. John Lynch didn't say goodbye to him last week on Monday. And we haven't heard anything from Robbie Gold in about a month. I thought the QB school video that JT Sullivan did on Kyle Shanahan was an April Fool's joke, first and foremost. Although I did note that, the, I mean, he had some nuggets of valuable information and it. some of the X's and O's were interesting. You know, I agree. Kyle Shanahan has a complex offense. Guys can sometimes be out of position. But, you know, offenses in the NFL in general are complex and teams have procedure penalties and teams have blown blocking assignments. It's about performance on the aggregate. The 49ers have been pretty damn efficient on the aggregate. So a lot of the nitpicking I think JT O'Sullivan did was done because it was an April Fool's joke. I mean, he was literally talking to himself dressed as Kyle Shanahan. The 49ers will make some moves before the draft because they still have what? Let's see. They still have, what, 25 spots to fill? It's been a while since they signed somebody, so I haven't been on the spreadsheet, but we can update you right now on the depth chart and the roster. There it is. 49ers are at 65. Yes, yeah, so they have 25 to fill. I mean, theoretically, they can fill 25 spots on draft weekend between 11 picks and 14 undrafted free agents, but I think it's likely they still pick up at least two or three more free agents. Last year, they were signing guys through the month of April. This week, I remember I was in Italy I was in I was in Prague at this time, and then I flew down to Italy. I think on April fourth, and I remember them signing. I think Marcus Johnson, the receiver, last year. They were making some third, fourth wave free agency micro transactions last year ahead of the NFL draft, which starts at the end of April. So that's where the 49ers are right now. Will the 49ers restructure to create more space down the line? 
Well, they currently don't need any space. This draft class is only going to cost about a million bucks in the top 51 rule. Then, you know, the top 51 rule stops counting once they cut down the 53 and the 49ers will calculate, okay, what's our 53 man roster looking like? Do we need to restructure anybody to make room for them on a salary cap 53 man roster? And at that point, maybe they do restructure somebody like Christian McCaffrey. Uh, you, you can go back and double restructure somebody, although I don't think they want to do that with Armstead or, or, or Trent Williams. But you'll be able to find some money if you need it because you don't need all that much. The 49ers have been really efficient with their money. They've been running at, at these mid-level exceptions. That's what I call them. It's the veteran salary benefit. And then NFL four-year qualifying player offer to Ross Dwelly. The 49ers have really set themselves up well by saving 100000 here, 25000 there, 600000 here. It's all added up to like two million nearly in savings for this team this year. And because of that, I think that they're gonna come in under the cap even after they sign their draft class. Unless, unless they really want to make a splashier signing. If they say screw it, let's go get Jadavian Clowney, I don't think they're gonna do that. If they say that and he wants more money, they can't fit him under the cap. In that point, you might have to run a restructure to make things work if you're the 49ers. The 49ers Pro Day is local prospects in the Bay Area. Showing up at Levi Stadium and working out. Scouts are there, uh, you know, for the 49ers. They could check it out. It's like a local pro day, a chance for local products to show off their what what they have. It's a, it's a showcase opportunity for local products. In a lot of ways, a community service thing for the 49ers. You know, a lot of these guys um, are playing at some smaller schools or didn't get as much attention at their colleges pro day. Having them out to the facility ensures that NFL scouts, the 49ers personnel people actually get a, a firm look at them. So it's a, it's a good, I think, situation for some of these local prospects. This is awesome. Thank you. Squirrel TV. Love your content to delivery sub to the athletic as well. Keep it up and congrats on the engagement. That is awesome. That is so nice of you. I really appreciate it. Yes, everybody go check out The Athletic. It is a dollar a month right now. I will actually even show you the page that you could sign up on uh, so that the, the sub comes through where it should come through. Here we go. Make this big up on the screen. Again, thanks to Squirrel TV. Here is the page. Everything's black and white because I've already clicked on all the articles. But if you go to this link, athletic.com slash author slash David Lombardi. I put it in the chat section. You can see all of the pieces and they look a little bit like this. There's Brock Purdy, seven takeaways in the meetings. And thanks again. I love, I love that comment. Thank you. Jerry Fernandez wants Jake Hayner to join the 49ers next year. I know a lot of people from Fresno do. <laughs> 49ers didn't notice Tom Brady. Well, nobody noticed Tom Brady until the late rounds, let's be honest. Took several rounds of misses even from the Patriots to get to Tom Brady. And then a, a Drew Bledsoe injury. Yeah, I mean, Robbie probably has too high of a demand for the 49ers right now, but it might come down. The market doesn't seem to be really working in his favor. There are a limited amount of kicker spots, and at least two of these are going to be taken by draftees, right? So... Robbie Gold at age 41 might not have had might not have as much negotiating leverage as he initially thought. What year was Tom Brady drafted? Uh, you're arguing with somebody in the comment section. Like two? No, no. Brady was drafted in in 2000, wasn't he? Was it 2000 or 99? Uh, either way, it was right when Steve Young was retiring for the 49ers. It's not because the 49ers didn't have a need for quarterback. It's it's because Tom Brady was overlooked by everybody, even the Patriots, right? It wasn't like he was a first, second, or third round pick. He was drafted way toward the end, a little bit ahead of Brock Purdy. But, uh, you know, it's, it's an amazing story for Purdy and especially for Tom Brady. Yeah, I mean, I don't think the quarterback competition is a problem. I think you know, John Lynch, Kyle Shanahan thinks it's a strength for the 49ers. They've got three guys, three darts to throw up against the wall at a total cost of $14 million. I mean, Javon Hargrave is making $21 million per year himself. The quarterback room, its combined cap hit is only $14.1 million. So the 49ers have been able to bolster the rest of the roster because quarterback is still on an affordable budget and – Sam Donald played really well then and last year in an offense that was very similar to what the 49ers run with positionless skill position players setting up yak all of the above. 
Uh, Brock Purdy obviously was awesome last year, but he's coming back from the elbow surgery. And Trey Lance, he's still the big unknown. So you take three swings at it, maybe four swings if you draft somebody. But if you're the 49ers, you, you know, you could be in a worse situation. You could be in one that's devoid of talent. And I don't think the 49ers are devoid of talent right now. The 49ers did draft the quarterback the year before. What was it? Jim Druckenmiller? The year before. I think it was, yeah, I think it was Jim Druckenmiller the year before. Uh, or was it Gio Carmazzi? Druckenmiller might have been 97. That might have been Gio Carmazzi. Either one didn't work out for the 49ers. Who starts week one? It's anybody get anybody's guess. These guys are all competing, and Brock Purdy has to get healthy. I think Purdy, given the health limitation right now, given the fact that they're saying it might be longer than week one, you know, he's if you had a bet on who to start in week one, I wouldn't bet on Brock Purdy. But I also wouldn't bet against Sam Darnold because, he, I mean, it, I talked about it last night. He's got a more extensive resume than Trey Lance. Trey is still the big unknown, and this offseason might answer some of those questions. Samuel wants the 49ers to get their quarterback, see how dangerous they'll be. Well, I mean, they had a really good quarterback last year, uh, two of them last year. They had Jimmy Garoppolo, then they had, and then they had Brock Purdy. And you saw how well the 49ers played. Garoppolo was number one DVOA. Purdy was, I think, number three or number four. They were both extremely efficient. They actually scored more when, when Purdy was in the game. They were clicking, I think, on, on all cylinders offensively by that point. And then everybody got hurt against the Eagles, but the 49ers were a buzzsaw with both of those quarterbacks plus Christian McCaffrey. They didn't lose when both of those quarterbacks finished a game healthy with Christian McCaffrey starting last year. Remember, they lost to the Chiefs, but McCaffrey was only playing on a pitch count. Then they lost to the Eagles, but they didn't have a healthy quarterback at the end of that game. So uh, this 49ers offense has had a good quarterback. It's just a matter of keeping them healthy. That's what's really important for the 49ers moving forward. I think Darnold has got, I don't know about arm strength per se, who can air it out 70 yards. That doesn't really matter though. I think Darnold has a more polished arm than Trey Lance, a quicker release. Darnold can make all the throws. He was a number three pick as well. Uh, I think Lance can make all the throws, but there are mechanical inconsistencies. And I think Darnold is much more consistent in that regard. But look at this. Squirrel TV is going crazy. Here's a couple questions. Any relation to Vince Lombardi? Um, man, every anytime somebody asks me if I'm related to Vince Lombardi, I uh, say only by name. Unfortunately, it's not uh, an actual connection. Although in Green Bay, they really like my last name. I've been there a couple of times. And am I a Niner fan? No, I, I can't be a fan of any team. I'm a reporter, right? I will tell you that I grew up and my favorite player was Steve Young. And that's actually a piece that I did write for The Athletic. This one's fun. Let's go. Let's find it. Since you just since you just subscribed to the Athletic, I figure that this is one that you could see. This is actually free to all subscriber or all non-subscribers because this was written during that that COVID time where where we had everything opened up. This is an article I wrote about my childhood, why Steve Young was my favorite player, and how that's come full circle. This was written shortly after the Super Bowl there in 2020. All right. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Yeah. I can name my future son Vince or Vincent, just like your last name, Brandon Vincent. You should change, you should change your first name to Lombardi. So your last, your, your name is Lombardi Vincent. This is kind of funny. Trey to traded. I don't think it's going to happen though, guys. I think the 49ers really, really want to see what they have with Lance and to bolster the quarterback room. Favorite article I ever wrote. Let's see here. I'm going to go, actually, I'm going, huh, it's not recent. I have to search for it. Let me search for it. 
Now I got it. Here it is. Center stage. Reliving the revolutionary Cowboys 49ers rivalry of the 1990s. This one, this one was a classic. It was an epic too. I mean, it went through. It talked, I talked to everybody, Steve Young, Jerry Rice, even the Cowboy side, Troy Aikman, Jimmy Johnson, Emmett Smith there on the screen. I mean, this is 6,000 words. There's Dion and Michael Irvin going through 49ers Cowboys. So, uh, yeah, this is the favorite article I've ever written. It's also the longest article that I've ever written. Culminating it with that, Steve Young diving over the goal line there for the score. So thank you. Oh, my God. You're going crazy. Look at that. That's awesome. You got some good viewers today. That's amazing. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it a lot. Appreciate everybody subscribing to The Athletic. If you want to, you can go and subscribe through that 49ers Cowboys piece. I will even copy and paste that link in the comment section if you want to read about the 49ers Cowboys rivalry of the 1990s. Load management with McCaffrey. To, well, I think that getting McCaffrey was load management for Debo Samuel. Remember Debo Samuel was hurt against the Seahawks when the 49ers clinched the division? I think that was a great example of Christian McCaffrey having a bigger load because Samuel was out. But both of these guys are relatively interchangeable. So load management just means, you know, the way that you get there is by stacking up the good players to make it all work. And uh, so the answer is yes, if he has them all healthy during the season. All right, this has been another 49er show. We talked a lot of Javon Kinlaw. That was fun. Answered some of your questions. Appreciate everybody. We will talk to you all very soon. Uh, big Debo Samuel update coming for you a little bit later today, explaining some of the contractual ins and outs of that situation. Everybody take care.